If you're here, you're familiar with this tale, right? In some way. But perhaps I can tell it to you in a way that you've not quite heard before. I will not obfuscate anything to tell a more riveting tale. That's not what I do. So perhaps I might surprise you with the beginning of my tellings. I do not begin with Mandus, our protagonist. I do not begin with Lilibeth, his wife and the mother of his twin sons. I do not start with the events that took place in Brennenburg in 1839. But we do return to a familiar character. One referred to as Great Uncle by Mandus. We begin with Alexander of Brennenburg. Alexander of Brennenburg was not a being native to this world. At the events of Brennenburg Castle in 1839, we know that Alexander had been trapped on this plane for over 300 years, a banished outcast from his home world, which he desperately was trying to return to. We knew little of his past beyond that, the specifics of his travels, his personal relationships, how he came to power within the ruling class. We do know that he mourned the loss of contact with a beloved being in his home world. But when he came to Earth, did he remain true to that love? Did Alexander ever have offspring, a family of his own, even for a short time? Well, we don't know. Alexander kept records of his bloodline a guarded secret to conceal the truth of his age, but I propose that that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if he had biological offspring or siblings that shared his blood. To Mandus, he was known as his great uncle. The fine details become irrelevant in the grander scheme. In 1890, Lilibeth, wife of Oswald Mandus, gave birth to twins. She survived long enough to greet her firstborn Edwin, but not the secondborn Enoch. Yes, she died during the birth. This broke the heart and soul of her husband Mandus. He vowed to take care of the boys. He became a supporter of a local orphanage, a charitable man, industrious, well-respected, and kind. Mandus would raise his sons well, and carry the memory of his beloved Lily with him as he did so. Now, eight years later, in 1898, we pick up with Mandus during a manic time. Though we can extrapolate some things during this time gap, Mandus had begun to experiment with a substance he called Chemical X. In its early form, a dead animal was immersed into the compound after being poisoned, and after running a current through the compound, it returned to life, though still poisoned. Again, this is an early form of Compound X. But why is Mandus doing this? Is there perhaps someone he dreams of returning to life? Perhaps a long-lost loved one? Soon after, we learn that Mandus is in deep financial troubles. He's squandered his family fortune on bad investments for his meat processing plant. Great machinery to streamline the industry are failing to perform to expectation or have been too costly to complete, given the lack of understanding of such things from creditors. It takes time, but eventually he recovers to some extent, and he begins to search for an answer for his great financial need to complete his machine. Presumably from guidance from the literature created by his great uncle Alexander, Mandus learns of a great treasure in the jungles of the Americas, within Mexico specifically and he deigns it a worthy expedition to take. Mandus calls them Old Stones. He brings with him his young twin sons, calling it an adventure for them to take together. There, they come across a steep-sided pyramid that once housed priests, where countless sacrifices were made to prevent the sky from falling upon them. Guided by a local, Mandus does indeed find a treasure. Mandus found an orb. While we know of the consequences of interacting with an orb from the Brennenberg incident, what happens to Mandus is new. He is granted an episode of divination, seeing the future of the world, its grand vision of coming wars, nuclear events, the suffering of the powerless, chemical warfare, and early deaths of his children, all at the hands 
of the powerful few of the world. When it comes to a solution, Mandis is shown that he must create a grand machine to free the wretches of the world from this future. He already has a basis within his factory in England. He has but to dig deeper into the earth and expand the great machine to bring salvation to mankind. But his first step in this process, to save mankind, is to save his twin boys. Here, in madness, he murders them upon an altar, pulling out their hearts. Mandis takes the orb, and a long fever takes him. He hallucinates and heaves constantly on the journey home. After arriving back in London, a great sorrow overtakes him as he sees the destitute conditions of the city. He sets off for home, vowing to repair it with his machine. He places the orb upon his mantle and takes up the task of murdering his servants and burying them in the garden. Efforts begin to expand upon his machinery within the meat processing plant. Several weeks later, Mandis receives a special crate, presumably from the rubble of Brennenberg. It is the corpse of a gatherer, humanoid in shape but deformed. Leather straps encase the torso. Muscle displacement and mutilations cover the corpse, though it is in remarkably good shape. He smells the reek of the orb upon it and senses his great uncle's presence within it. But here, Mandis decides that he does not agree with his great uncle's methods. He will not use man as his test subjects like Alexander did. He will instead begin with swine. They are loyal, clever, strong, and easily sated. For the following months, Mandis's fever and hallucinations continue. The effects of the orb upon, or within him. He remembers distorted events from his trip to Mexico and the temple. He sees and hears his children playing within his house, which frightens him greatly. But this also motivates him to continue his journey, to rescue mankind from the events of the coming century. Experimenting with the Brennenberg Vitae, a more stable version of Compound X is created. Mandis is able to elevate his creations from simply wild mad pigs driven insane through his methods to a hybrid of human and pig flesh given life with the compound. His hatred of modern society continues to deepen, and the hallucinations of his children and the future of the world become fanatical beliefs of truth. His workforce has grown to accommodate the expansion of his machinery into the earth, a workforce all too willing to ignore the tragedies taking place within the tunnels of Mandis's mad ideals. Even children are employed to clear vents and tubing. They are treated as expendable, replaceable, no value is given to life in this place. As his madness deepens, false accounts provided by himself are given to himself. Words of praise for his charitable works, housing and feeding the poor, masses of the most vulnerable flock to him, flock to his factory, flock to a church attached to it. People whose society would not miss, people that would benefit from death, to be saved from the hardships of their coming days. It's a mercy, no? End them before the suffering begins. Remake them into something new. Give them a purpose. But amongst the false notes of praise, he also finds diary notes from his long dead sons. Words that dredge up guilt and paranoia within Mandus. But he does not doubt the sincerity of them. He is fully engaged within the delusions of his world now. Gone now is his desire to return them to life with science as well. Instead, he is only a destructive and murderous force. By the time nearing the year's end, before the turn of the new century, Mandis's machinery and process has become so streamlined that he culls dozens of unfortunate victims at a time into his machine. Human oversight is not required. But it is not just the poor being targeted now. Anyone who enters his home or his factory, be they artisan, a politician, a priest, or a businessman, are all to be victims of the machine. 
we finally meet Mandus after all this has occurred. We meet him as he rises from his caged bed, delirious and sick, hearing the sounds of his boys playing in the starkly empty mansion that he resides within. They're always out of reach, as though pulling him someplace. He must go after them. He feels that they are in danger. They have gone into the machine, and he must save them. As any loving and dutiful father would, without hesitation, he descends into the abyss of it. Along the way, receiving messages and phone calls from an unknown companion, a man claiming to know Mandus, he pushes him forward to save his children, guiding him along, giving him updates on their conditions as they tread deeper into forbidden territory. Mandus has told them many times to stay out of the factory, to stay away from the machine, yet now they're diving into it. It takes some time. But Mandus remembers, eventually, what he did to his boys, Edwin and Enoch. The things he did with the machine. The orb taken from the temple in the jungle of Mexico. The orb that he placed in the heart of the machine. The orb which powers this monster, which is also intertwined with his very being. The calls are from the machine, therefore they are from himself. All hope is abandoned by Mandus, but before he lays down to accept the end, he decides to defy the will of the machine. He will become its saboteur. He will undo what he has done before the dawn of the 20th century begins, but he hasn't much time left. In the end, after all is said and done, Mandus does indeed reach the power center of the machine. He does end the operations of the machine, and he ends himself with it, his heart ripped from his chest. But we must ask, what became of the orb?